Section 4 of Astounding Stories, May 1931. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dark Moon, Chapter 3 The Space Terror The control room was glassed in on all sides. The thick, triple lenses were free from clouding, and the glasses between them kept out the biting cold of the heights. The glass was strong, to hold the pressure of one atmosphere that was maintained within the ship. The lookouts gave free vision in all directions except directly below the hull, and a series of mirrors corrected this defect. But Walt Harkness had eyes solely for the black void ahead. Only the brilliant stars shone now in the mantle of velvety night. No flashing lights denoted the passing of liners, for they were safe in the harbor of the lower levels. He moved the controls once to avoid the green glare of an ascending area, and he knew that there were no ships to fear and let the automatic control put him back on his course. Before him, under a hooded light, was a heavy lens. It showed in the magnification a portion of the globe. There were countries and seas on a very colored map, and one pinpoint of brilliance that marked his ever-changing position. He watched the slow movement of the glowing point. The central federated states of Europe were behind him. The point was tracing a course over the vast reaches of the patchwork map that meant the many democracies of Russia. This cruiser of Schwartzmann's was doing five hundred miles an hour, and the watching man cursed under his breath at the slow progress of the tiny light. But the light moved, and the slow hours passed, while Harkness tried to find consolation in surmises he told himself must be true. Chet had been delayed, he insisted to himself. Chet could never have finished the work in two days. He had been bluffing good-naturedly when he threatened to fly the ship alone. The Arctic Ocean was beneath. The tiny light had passed clear of the land on the moving chart. He would be there soon. Of course Chet had been fooling. He was always ready for a joke. Great fellow, Chet. They had taken their training together, and Chet had gone on to win a master pilot's rating, the highest to be had. Another hour, and a rising hum from a buzzer beside him gave warning of approach to the destination he had fixed. The automatic control was warning him to decelerate. Harkness well knew what was expected of the pilot when that humming sounded, yet with total disregard for the safety of his helicopters he dived at full speed for the denser air beneath. He felt the weight that came suddenly upon him as he drove through and beneath the repelling area, and he flattened out and checked his terrific speed when the gauges quivered at forty thousand. Then down and still down in a long slanting dive, till a landmark was found. He was off his course a bit, but it was a matter of minutes until he circled, checked his wild flight, and sank slowly beneath the lift of the dual fans to set the ship down as softly as a snowflake beside a building that was dark and forbiddingly silent. A lonely outpost in a lonely waste. No answer came to his hail. The building was empty. The ship was gone. And Chet! Chet Bullard! Harkness's head was heavy on his shoulders. His feet took him with hopeless, lagging steps to his waiting ship. He was tired, and the long strain of the flight had been in vain. He was suddenly certain of disaster, and Chet—Chet was up there at some hitherto untouched height, battling with—what? He broke into a stumbling run, and drew himself within the little ship. He was helpless. The ship was unarmed, even if the weapons of his world were of use against this unknown terror. But he knew that he was going up. He would find Chet if he could get within reach of his ship. He would warn him. He tried to tell himself that he might yet be in time. The little cruiser rose slowly under the lift of the fans. Then he opened the throttle and swept out in a parabolic curve that ended in a vertical line. Straight up the ship roared. It shot through a stratum of clouds. The sun that was under the horizon shone redly now. It grew to a fiery ball. The earth contracted. The markings that were coastlines and mountains drew in upon themselves. He passed the repelling area and felt the lift of its mysterious force, the R.A. effect, that permitted the high-level flying of the world. His speed increased. It would diminish again as the R.A. effect grew less. Record flights had been made to another ten thousand. He wondered what the ceiling would be for the ship beneath him. He would soon learn. He set his broadcast call for the number of Chet's ship. They had been given an experimental license, and EL-29X—the instrument was flashing—EL-29X. 
Above the heavy side layer that had throttled the radio of earlier years, he knew that his call from so small an instrument as this would be carried for hundreds of miles. He reached the limit of his climb and was suddenly weightless, floating aimlessly within the little room. The ship was falling, and he was falling with it. His speed of descent built up to appalling figures until his helicopters found air to take their thrust. And still no answering word from Chet. The cruiser was climbing again to the heights. The hands of Harkness, trembling slightly now, held her to a vertical climb, while his eyes crept back to the unlit plate where Chet's answering call should flash. But his own call would be a guide to Chet. The directional finders on the new ship would trace the position of his own craft, if the new ship were afloat. If it were not lying crushed on the ice below, empty, like the liners, of any sign of life. His despairing mind snapped sharply to attention. His startled jerk threw the ship widely from her course. A voice was speaking. Chet's voice. It was shouting in the little room. "'Go down, Walt,' it told him. "'For God's sake, go down. I'm right above you. I've been fighting them for an hour, but I'll make it.' He heard the clash of levers thrown sharply over in that distant ship. His own hands were frozen to the controls. His ship roared on in its upward course. The futile E. L. 29X of his broadcast call, still going out to a man who could not remove his hands to send an answer, but who had managed to switch on his sending set into which he could shout. Harkness was staring into the black void whence the wireless voice had come, staring into the empty night, and then he saw them. The thin air was crystal clear, his gaze penetrated for miles, and far up in the heights where his own ship could never reach and where no clouds could be, were diaphanous wraiths. Like streamers of cloud in long serpentine forms, they writhed and shot through space with lightning speed. They grew luminous as they moved living streamers of moonlit clouds. A whirling cluster was gathered into a falling mass. Out of it, in a sharp right turn, shot a projectile, tiny and glistening against the velvet black. The swarm closed in again. There were other lashing shapes that came diving down. They were coming toward him. And, in his ears, a voice was imploring, "'Down! Down! The R.A. tension may stop them. Go down! I am coming. You can't help. I'll make it. They'll rip you to pieces.' The wraith-like coils that had left the mass above had straightened to sharp spearheads of speed. They were darting upon him, swelling to monstrous size in their descent. And Walt Harkness saw in an instant the folly of delay. He was not helping Chet, but only hindering. His ship swung end for end under his clutching hands, and the thrust of his stern exhaust was added to the pull of earth to throw him into a downward flight that tore even the thin air into screaming fragments. One glance through the lookouts behind him showed lashing serpent forms, translucent as pale fire, impossible beasts from space. His reason rejected them while his eyes told him the terrible truth. Despite the speed of his dive, they were gaining on him, coming up fast. One snout that ended in a cupped depression was plain. A mouth gaped beneath it. Above was a roll of discs that were eyes, eyes that shone more brightly than the luminous body behind, eyes that froze the mind and muscles of the watching man in utter terror. He forced himself to look ahead, away from the spectral shapes that pursued. They were close, yet he thrilled with the realization that he had helped Chet in some small degree. He had drawn off this group of attackers. He felt the upthrust of the R.A. effect. He felt, too, the pull of a body that had coiled about his ship. No intangible vaporous thing, this. The glass of his control room was obscured by a clinging, glowing mass, while still the little cruiser tore on. Before his eyes the glowing windows went dark, and he felt the clutching thing stripped from the hull as the ship shot through the invisible area of repulsion. A scant hundred yards away a huge cylinder drove crashingly past. Its metal shone and glittered in the sun. He knew it for his own ship, his and Chet's. And what was within it? What of Chet? The loudspeaker was silent. He eased the thundering craft that bore him into a slow-forming curve that did not end for fourscore miles before the wild flight was checked. He swung it back to guide the ship with shaking hands where a range of mountains rose in icy blackness, and where a gleaming cylinder rested upon a bank of snow whose white expanse showed a figure that came staggering to meet him. 
Some experiences and dangers that come to men must be talked over at once. Thrills and excitement and narrow escapes must be told and compared. And then, at rare times, there are other happenings that strike too deeply for speech, terrors that rouse emotions beyond mere words. It was so with Harkness and Chet. A gripping of hands, a perfunctory good work, old man, and that was all. They housed the two ships, closing the great doors to keep out the Arctic cold. And then Chet Bullard threw himself exhausted upon a cot, while he stared, still wordless, at the high roof overhead. But his hands that gripped and strained at whatever they touched told of the reaction to his wild flight. Harkness was examining their ship, where shreds of filmy, fibrous material still clung, when Chet spoke. "'You knew they were there?' he asked. "'And you came up to warn me?' "'Sure.' Harkness answered simply. "'Thanks,' Chet told him with equal brevity. Another silence. Then, "'All right, tell me. What's the story?' And Walt Harkness told him in brief sentences of the worldwide warning that had flashed, of the liners crashing to earth and their cabins empty of human life. "'They could do it,' said Chet. "'They could open the ports and ram those snaky heads inside to feed.' He seemed to muse for a moment upon what might have come to him. My speed saved me, he told Harkness. Man, how that ship can travel! I shook them off a hundred times, outmaneuvered them when I could, but they came right back for more. How do they propel themselves? he demanded. No one knows, Harkness told him. That luminosity in action means something. Some conversion of energy, electrical perhaps, to carry them on lines of force of which we know nothing as yet. That's a guess, but they do it. You and I can swear to that. Chet was pondering deeply. "'High-level lanes are closed,' he said, "'and we are blockaded like the rest of the world. It looks as if our space flights were off. And the dark moon trip. We could have made it, too.' If there was a questioning note in those last remarks, it was answered promptly. "'No,' said Harkness, with explosive emphasis. "'They won't stop me.' He struck one clenched fist upon the gleaming hull beside him. "'This is all I've got, and I won't have this if that gang of Schwartzmann's gets his hands upon it. The best I could expect would be a long-drawn fight in the courts, and I can't afford it. I am going up. We've got something good here. We know it's good, and we'll prove it to the world by reaching the dark moon." Another filmy, fibrous mass that had been torn from one of the monsters of the heights slid from above to make a splotch of colorless matter upon the floor. Harkness stared at it. The firm line of his lips set more firmly still, but his eyes had another expression as he glanced at Chet. He would go alone if he must. No barricade of unearthly beasts could hold him from the great adventure. But Chet? He must not lead Chet to his death. Of course, he said slowly, you've had one run-in with the brutes. Again he paused. We don't know where they come from, but my guess is from the dark moon. They may be too much for us. If you don't feel like tackling them again— The figure of Chet Bullard sprang upright from the cot. His harsh voice told of the strain he had endured, and his reaction from it. "'What are you trying to tell me?' he demanded. "'Are you trying to leave me out?' Then at the look in the other's eyes he grinned sheepishly at his own outburst. And Walter Harkness threw one arm across Chet's shoulder, as he said, "'I hoped you would feel that way about it. Now let's make some plans.' Provisions for one year. Even in concentrated form this made a prodigious supply. And arms— pistols and rifles, with cases of cartridges whose every bullet was tipped with the deadly detonite. All this was brought from the nearest accessible points. They landed, though, in various cities, keeping Schwartzmann's ship as inconspicuous as possible, and made their purchases at different supply-houses to avoid two-pointed questioning, for Harkness found that he and Bullard were marked men. The newscaster in the Schwartzmann cabin brought the information. It brought, too, continued reports of the menace in the upper air. It told of patrol ships sent down to destruction with no trace of commander or crew, and a cruiser of the International Peace Enforcement Service came back with a story of horror and helplessness. Their armament was useless. No shells could be timed to match the swift flight of the incredible monsters, and impact charges failed to explode on contact. The filmy, fibrous masses offered little resistance to the shells that pierced them. Yet a wrecked after-compartment and smashed port-lights and doors gave evidence of the strength of the brutes, when their great sinuous bodies, lined with rows of suction-discs, secured a hold. 
speed was chet bullard's answer to this when the newscaster ceased speed until we find something better i got clear of them when they caught me unprepared but we can rip right through them now that we know what we're up against he had turned again to the packing of supplies but harkness was held by the sound of his own name mr walter harkness late of new york was very much in the day's news when a young millionaire loses all his wealth beneath a tidal wave when further he flies to vienna and transfers all rights in the great firm of harkness incorporated to the schwartzmann interests in part settlement of his obligations and still further when he is driven to fury by his losses and attacks the great herr schwartzmann in a murderous frenzy wounds him and escapes in schwartzmann's own ship that is an item that is worth broadcasting between announcements of greater importance it interested harkness beyond a doubt he remembered the shot outside the cabin as he took off in his wild flight schwartzmann had been wounded it seemed and he was to be blamed for the assault he smiled grimly as he heard the warrant for his arrest broadcast every patrol ship would be on the watch and there would be a dozen witnesses to swear to the truth of schwartzmann's lie the plan seemed plain to him he saw himself in custody taken to vienna and then at the best months of waiting in the psychopathic ward of a great institution where the influence of herr schwartzmann would not be slight and meanwhile schwartzmann would have his ship clever but not clever enough he would fool them he and chet then he recalled the girl mademoiselle diane a slim figure outlined in a lighted window of the old chateau was there hope there he wondered had her clear smiling eyes seen what occurred nonsense he told himself she saw nothing in that storm and besides she is one of their crowd tarred with the same stick forget her but he knew as he framed the unspoken words that the advice was vain he would never forget her there was a picture in his mind that could not be blotted out a picture of a tall slender girl trim and straight in her mannish attire who came toward him from her little red speedster she held out her hand impulsively and her eyes were smiling as she said we will be generous monsieur harkness generous his smile was bitter as he turned to help chet in their final work End of chapter 3